Hi, everyone. Welcome to Retire with Style. I'm Wade, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alex. And we're happy to also have a special guest this week, John Faustino. Uh, Alex, can, can you go ahead and let us give us a little bit of background about John and, and what we're going to be talking about today? Well, uh, if you don't how, about have let, small talk. How, how, about, how about we let John say hi? You cut him off, Wade. You cut him off. <laughs> hi, Wade, he was hi, waving Wade. his hands. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. All right, no, it's our pleasure. And here's a little bit of background about John. Uh, he's one of the good guys in the in the industry. And so we thought it'd be a great way. You know, we have a mix of, of audiences, right? We have uh, advisors and we also have, a, you know, a significant, if not more so, number of consumers and individual investors, if you will. And so I, I think John presents a nice nexus of of what's going on behind the scenes to the benefit of consumers and you know to the knowledge base of advisors like i said he's one of the good guys and why i say that is because you know he's he's the head of fi 360 and uh within there he serves as a chief product and strategy officer uh he's had a lifetime behind the scenes uh, trying to bring these fiduciary concepts to the forefront to advisors and which in turn push them out to uh, underlying consumers. And so this is a concept that, you know, you see it now out there. It's kind of in the zeitgeist of, of things. This whole fiduciary, what is fiduciary? You know, that was kind of the marketing message five years ago. Now I, I get the sense that informed consumers know there's still some folks that are still trying to figure that out. But I, I think there's just headline knowledge. And so we wanted to bring John in for that reason. And we'll get to and the other reason I wanted to bring we wanted to bring John in is John is our you know this is kind of the, the rollout of our advisory board for the RISA. We had Michael Finke last time on the podcast. And so today we wanted to introduce John Faustino, who also graciously uh, accepted to join us. So that's those are the reasons for this. And and John, as as we begin this, uh, why don't we start off with the advisory board? Why you decided to join, and then we'll move on to your your kind of like the your your history and the like. If 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 you don't mind, does that sound like a good plan, Wade and John? It does. Sounds great to me. Sounds great to me. Thank you again for having me, and I am I'm really thrilled to be a part of the RISA advisory board. And from the first introduction that was made for me to both of you and RISA. I was impressed with what you'd put together. There's absolutely a need in the market for a categorization system for retirement income solutions and end investors. And it aligns really well with the retirement income consortium, which we started at FI360, Broadridge FI360 Solutions earlier this year. So the, the connection that I saw with our retirement income consortium and I would say that even if it wasn't aligned with a business initiative that I that I had, I was very impressed with both of you um, and and the fact that you're you're not only PhDs and you have that subject matter expertise, but you both really have pragmatic perspectives on how to apply theory in action. So it was it was the combination of those things that that made me really excited when you gave me the opportunity to join the board. No, no. Th th I mean, the reality is that we're, we're tickled pink to, to have you. I mean, like, like I said, you're somebody that has just a history of, of doing good within the industry. And as we've gotten to know you over, over this past year, it's one of those that only people that we really want to hang out with are, are kind of <laughs> invited. And so we're, we're, we're thrilled that you decided to, to take us up on this and how you can help us with the RISA as it applies to the fiduciary concept and, and also within the defined contribution marketplace, which is the, four, the land of the 401ks and 403bs that we'll talk about uh, during the course of this conversation, which you know is ultimately important for investors since there's, there's, a, there's a, a reckoning of sorts that, that I believe is, has started that is beginning to come down this marketplace that it, it's good for everyone to really know. But as we begin to get into that frame, do you mind just giving us a, you know, how you got here kind of vibe with some sort of common fabrics that you've had along your professional trajectory? So give sure. people some context. 
Sure. And I'll say, and it, it, it means a lot to me that you say that I'm one of the good guys. Uh, that That is not something that I take with a grain of salt. Um, I've always been very much focused on doing the right thing for end investors. When I was in college, I, I interned at one of the wirehouses. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name the the wirehouse because they did some things there where um, I I wasn't necessarily um, completely aligned with with what they were doing in terms of um, encouraging the sales of certain mutual funds just just to get the sales and that fiduciary um, you know a- awareness really came to me when I was 19 years old. I worked in financial services from the time I was in my my mid 20s. Um, left it for a little while, went back to school, spent 15 years at uh, Morningstar, which, um, you know, very much had that put investors first at the core of their, of their guiding principles, and then found my way to FI360 when one of my colleagues at Morningstar, Matt Wolmowitz, um, had, had gone to FI360. He brought me over uh, a year or two after he started. So I feel like financial services, helping people, um, really helping advisors help end investors has been um, kind of in my in my blood in my DNA for about 30 years now, and that's been the the common thread for me is doing the right thing for for end investors no matter what I'm doing in financial services. No, thank you, John. And and John, I I know you didn't want to name that firm just for everyone. It was Jackson Steinem and Company. <laughs> Wait, where's that from? Wait, where's that from? Jackson Steinem. I don't know. That's that. from Wall Street, the movie Wall Street. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought it was Dewey, Cheatham, and Hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, John. I, I couldn't. I couldn't help myself. Pop <laughs> <Talk> culture references. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, wait. Anything from from that vantage point? No, I mean, I think that's good background. I guess the common thread between what you were doing at Morningstar, and because maybe a lot of listeners are not aware of FI360, probably most of our listeners have heard of Morningstar, but could just what exactly is it that you're doing there in terms of bringing that sort of fiduciary concept or or helping us better provide that fiduciary service? Sure. So, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the term fiduciary from the 2016 Department of Labor fiduciary rule that was actually vacated in May of 2018. But um, about seven years ago or so, fiduciary started becoming very mainstream in, um, in media and, and the like. FI360 started in 1999. So they've been around for more than 20 years, and they really were focused on bringing a fiduciary standard of care to financial services. And they, they did that a few different ways. So they created prudent practices for financial advisors and investment stewards who are like plan sponsors, for example, and asset managers. And they, they focused on understanding the legislation, regulation, and the case law associated with that fiduciary standard of care. They were convinced that that is the best way to serve end investors. Um, So what they do now is they've taken those prudent practices. It's really the blueprint that we have for everything that we do from a services and an offerings perspective. We train financial advisors on how to be fiduciaries. We've got over 12,000 designees that are active today. We provide software to financial advisors and to other financial institutions to help them act with a fiduciary standard of care. And then we provide data and analytics as well too to help folks evaluate mutual funds and exchange traded funds, for example, to ensure that they adhere to a fiduciary um, standard of care from a selection standpoint. And we provide some um, analytics as well too, to home offices, asset managers, and uh, broker dealers. We do some things to help them with um, IRA rollovers and the like. So really focused on helping financial intermediaries, focused on financial advisors, help individuals um, invest with uh, with a fiduciary standard is is really the focus. So, so is it, it, if I'm hearing it, and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm kind of trying to listen to it now with my in, individual investor hat on, right? And so if I'm making sense of what you said, it's effectively you provide a system a systematized toolbox, so financial advisors can implement best fiduciary practices for their underlying clients. That's right. That's right. So a lot of our focus is really on operational efficiencies and the like. So acting as a, as a fiduciary, um, you know, requires effort. It requires process. 
So what we've done is create the training and create the software and the data that helps streamline that process. So if you are acting as a fiduciary advisor, you can hopefully manage more clients with, with less effort based on the training and the tools that we so, provide. So there's a scalability to it, which is good. Now, now I, I kind of want to, just the word fiduciary, obviously advisors understand what that means and the nuances. Without getting into sort of case law, because I think when advisors get into this, they go deep into the weeds with regards to, you know, citing laws and, and stuff like that. And me, I just break down fiduciary in terms of like the golden rule. You know, I keep it simple, you know, treat people how you would want to be treated, you know, kind of thing. But that's that's my view. That's I realize that doesn't generalize to everyone. Results vary. Uh, and then there's the marketing ploy of you do well and we do well. You see, we're fiduciaries, you know, that that kind of thing. How would you, if, if somebody's listening in, you know, the sort of the standard 30 seconds or less, but it doesn't have to be. I just mean in from a, from being concise. How would you describe to a consumer what even does what what does it even mean to enable an advisor to be a fiduciary in you know in layman's layperson's terms? Yeah, sure. So I like you know I I understand your your concept of the you know the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would say that there's two things that we really focus on when we talk about acting in a fiduciary capacity, and one of them is the duty of loyalty, and that really fits <laughs> to your golden rule, where the duty of loyalty is that you act in the best interests of your end client. Just like if someone goes to a doctor, if they go to a lawyer, if they go to a CPA, those individuals are always acting in your best interest. Um, so that duty of loyalty is really foundational. And then the one thing that I'd add on to that is the duty of care. So it's not only acting in the best interest of your clients, but doing so in a competent way. So there's the, the prudent person rule. So how would a similar individual with similar training in a similar role what would you expect them to do from a research perspective, from a disclosure perspective, from an analysis perspective to serve their clients? So it's really that duty of loyalty, that golden rule combined with that duty of care where you're acting in a competent manner, you've got the training, you can actually perform the work that combines together to make a really solid fiduciary advisor. That's a good point, John. You know what? I was taking the duty of care for granted. I just assume. Everyone kind of keeps up with the literature, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, I understand that's that's not reality. Yeah, it's a really important distinction that you can't really act in someone's best interests if you're not competent to be able to figure out what their what the best interest is. So that's absolutely where you serve that very valuable function of providing the education and the best practices of, of how to and be able to serve the client's best interest. And so if you're in a, if, if again, with my investor hat on, okay, John, how do I know that my advisor is acting in my best interest? Are there any tells? Because, you know, I, I, I talk to my advisor and they just tell me, yeah, we act in your best interest. Or, you know, they give me some general terms and, you know, there's other, there's other like consumers and we've gotten this at McLean where they say, can you put this in writing or, or this or that? And, you know, truthfully, part of that is it's not that I don't want to put it in writing. It's almost like I don't want to deal with people like that because if they start off the relationship like that, it's almost like, you know, they sort of scare me off from that vantage point. But what is what is the good dynamic that a consumer or an individual investor should expect with uh, an advisor to know that they are acting in their best interest besides kind of the, the sound bites? Well, I, I think um, you, you make a great point, and I think there's a lot of individuals who are in financial services who say, <clears throat> hey, we, we do the right thing, you know, we, we take care of our clients and the like. What we suggest that end investors do is ask their advisor or prospective advisor directly, are you a fiduciary? Um, so there's a difference between saying, hey, I do the right thing, <clears throat> I do what's in my client's best interest, and explicitly acknowledging that they are fiduciaries. Um, it's great if they do that in writing. Oftentimes you can tell from their website if they are a fiduciary or not. But, you know, we, we suggest that you actually ask the question, are you a fiduciary? Because to, to your point, I think there's a lot of people that play kind of fast and loose with words and terms and, um, you know, suggest that they're maybe doing things that they aren't. 
So you've got a responsibility as a consumer. If you think about all the research you do when you're buying a car or, you know, looking at what you're going to buy off the menu, you ask the, the waiter or the waitress questions on what you're going to eat and what's in this, what's in that. Um, you shouldn't be afraid to ask the individual that you're entrusting with your financial health if they're a fiduciary, which really summarizes those, you know, duties of care and, and duties of loyalty together. Nice. I guess a, maybe a follow-up question there is just, there are advisors who can wear multiple hats. And so it, depending on which hat they're wearing for a particular occasion, <laughs> how, how does the consumer get a sense of what that means, what the answer means and, and whether does the answer have, is it based on regulation of yes, I'm regulated as a fiduciary or does the advisor, are they able to say, I'm a fiduciary because I do want to serve your best interests? How, how can the consumer really evaluate the, the answer that they're receiving? I think, I think that's a great question, Wade. And I'll say that what, what we're seeing um, at the end of 2021, for the first time, we had more fee-based advisors who are fiduciary advisors and dually registered advisors, which is which is what you're getting at. So those folks that are acting up in a, a fee-based capacity, they charge a percentage of, of assets. And if you do better, they get they get paid more. But they also may do some business where they get a commission. Um, we had more, and we call those folks hybrid advisors. So there were more fee-based and hybrid advisors than there were pure commission advisors for the first time ever in December of 2021 relative to what we've seen in, in the past. So the trend is moving towards more advisors acting in a fee-based capacity, whether it's solely fee-based or, or in that hybrid capacity. And, and I think there is an opportunity for advisors to educate certainly the clients as well too. There, there may be some instances where it's better for them to act in a commission-based capacity from a, um, from a client best interest um, perspective. So the, the manner in which they're being paid, fee-based or commission-based, um, may vary when they're doing what's in the best interest of a given client, depending on, on what that activity is. So again, I would, I would put it on the investor to ask, are you a fiduciary? And if the advisor comes back with, well, um, I act in a fiduciary capacity at some times, I act in a, in a different capacity at others, for, for them to really have that back and forth conversation. Um, so it can be two ways. And I think to the extent an advisor is acting in a hybrid capacity and they're doing so to better serve their clients, they should have uh, the, the ability to articulate that clearly and, and succinctly to the folks they're working with. John, would for a consumer, would this be in any document already, like in an, in a, ADV and ADV is a, a brochure that the advisor sort of presents to a consumer, letting them know how they do business. Would 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 a consumer be able to read that stuff in in those documents in that brochure? There are disclosures in the um, in the CRDs and the 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 various filing documents that the advisors um, put out there. So that's that's one thing certainly that folks <laughs> can look at. Um, I would I would suggest that having a conversation in addition to reviewing those materials is is a way to go to um, get context from the advisor and, and have things be explained. The the reality I, is that very few folks go to those documents and, and read them. I, I I agree a hundred percent, and that's why I made my comment about the documents earlier. That you know when when you come in, if if a prospect comes in, sort of asking for things and writing, it's well within the right, but it, it's one of those that it kind of. I don't know. I, I just like a friendlier dialogue to, to start with, which is just let's have a conversation and, and, and discuss how, you know, how, you know, what fits your needs, et cetera. And, and on that, to, to piggyback on something you said, is fee only the only way you can be a fiduciary? And what I mean by that in a generally in a generalization kind of way that if you if you sell any form of contractual income, what you're doing is is a is a non fiduciary kind of uh, action. How would you respond to a statement like that? Yeah, I would say I would I would say that um, you know delineate how someone is being compensated from whether they're acting with the duties of loyalty and the duties of care. So 
fee-based advisors are fiduciary um, advisors, but it's it's one of those things where you you can't necessarily judge a book by its cover. And I think it gets back to how you evaluate a financial advisor and if, if they're a good fit for you. Certainly, I would recommend everyone looks for fiduciary advisors, but there's a personality fit and everything else. And if you go, go back to the Ronald Reagan, uh, trust but verify, where you have the conversations and you and you get the information. Um, and then maybe you you check the the filings that folks have to um, to verify that. So I would say that there are certainly opportunities for advisors to act in the um, best interests of a client. So they're showing that duty of loyalty. They're employing that golden rule that you referenced, um, Alex. And they're also very competent and they're doing things in a thoughtful way from a uh, analysis standpoint with their recommendations and what they're making available to clients. Um, and they could potentially do that and make a commission um, or they could do that and, and make a fee, a percentage of assets instead. So I would delineate those two things. Um, it's, it's really a, a question of order of magnitude and um, scale. If you, if you were to classify someone as fiduciary or not a fiduciary based on whether they charge a percentage of assets or a fee, well, what if that percentage of assets is 18% of your portfolio I'm going to take every year? Um, and what if the fee is, uh, you know, a penny that I'm charging you? So all those things I think have to be put into context. Uh, I, I agree a hundred percent. Uh, I, I, you know, I've had my significant convictions about this, but, uh, you know, that's curious where, where you're at this and wait, I'd, I'd like to actually ask you something simply because, you know, we talk about it a lot off, off the air and, uh, and just to get your thoughts on your research and how you view it from this from this from this manner you know the sort of scientific method and how that blends into a fiduciary is a, if at all and uh i'm going to kind of put you on the spotlight here a little bit wade writes a lot about the the place for contractual income within a retirement income strategy uh wade gets a lot of heat from advisors that just follow an assets a, a fee only model be it only assets under management or a flat fee or whatnot, it, whatever it is that they don't, you know, whatever the advisor's business model is that they don't look at annuities within the construct of a retirement income plan. And not everyone, but a, a lot of folks, you know, Wade receives a lot of email from folks saying, Wade, you're just pushing annuities here. How could you do this? You know, this is bad. This is kind of, you're not, you're not acting in the best interest of your client. You're just kind of fitting the research to kind of market annuities. And I, I want to bring that up because, you know, I, I almost feel like fighting for Wade, you know, when, when we get enough of these, you know, but, you know, Wade's a big boy, right? And and so within that, you know, but these guys wave this or these folks wave this flag of fiduciary. Why uh, these th th this research is kind of unhinged, if you will. What What's your what's your feeling uh, when, when you get those kind of emails or comments and, and, and things along those lines, Wade? Well, I mean, I think this is the whole issue of retirement income and the the simple idea that developed around fiduciary being fee only, generally being assets under management. It's you mentioned already, like if your portfolio grows, we're paid more. So our incentives are aligned. Uh, you could argue that that sort of concept works pre-retirement during the wealth accumulation phase, but it really breaks down post-retirement because we know they're are multiple retirement styles. Not everyone's comfortable generating a retirement income from a, an investment portfolio. And historically, uh, an annuity or other types of financial tools maybe weren't available in that fee-only world. They, they may provide a commission. Now, there are, we know, fee-only annuities today so that an investment manager can use those tools and still be able to charge. And that's ultimately how the advisor is compensated. If, if a commission inherently makes it impossible to be a fiduciary that in a legal sense, that's problematic because building a retirement income plan means managing a new set of risks where people are not always comfortable going with an investments only approach. And an investment manager who is fiduciary fee only, if they have to give up assets, because they're going to suggest the client go find an annuity that may be commission based, then they they ha can charge less fees to that client. And so they're not fully incentivized to look at the big picture. They're kind of incentivized to think that total return 
is the best retirement income strategy and that everyone should use total return and that all these other strategies are wrong. And that's how they can still maintain in their own mind that they are fiduciary. But at the end of the day, retirement is different and we do need to be able to talk about serving client interests, perhaps with tools that don't align with that pre-retirement wealth accumulation fee only concept or fiduciary concept that kind of became part of the conventional wisdom. Yeah, it's sort of like winning the marketing game more than anything. But John, I saw you nodding a lot. You want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'd say that that really resonates with me. And I think oftentimes that's where I, you know, I, I like Alex when you were talking about the, the golden rule and simply, you know, what does it mean to be a fiduciary? It's about doing the right thing for your clients and doing it with a, with a high standard of care. We, um, I don't get as many emails as, as Wade does just because I'm not as popular and, and famous as he is. Um, but I, I will say that we have similar, um, maybe in, in, a, in a similar context, I can share that we'd have some advisors that would say, you know what, we don't need to, to do fiduciary training. We don't need tools for it. We buy indexed funds and indexed funds are inexpensive and that's in the best interest of my clients. What I point out is that we evaluate every mutual fund that, that Morningstar covers. And the last time I looked, it's been a couple of years, but it's fairly consistent. 17 or 18 percent of the indexed mutual funds that um, that we score and evaluate were in our, our fourth quartile poor you know poor selections for fiduciary accounts so i think oftentimes um, you know advisors do this and investors sometimes do this where they take these general generalizations um, annuities were sold um, in in a very poor way a lot of them to individuals in the late 90s early 2000s 2000s. So they just put this big X over annuities. Annuities are bad. Um, the structure is not necessarily bad. The sales practices uh, were bad. Not every index mutual fund is a, is a good selection for a fiduciary account. Um, so I, I, I just feel some commonality with um, maybe the, the generalizations that have been shared around annuities. And I certainly agree that, you know, we, we have to take a, a principles based approach when we're thinking about how we can best serve end investors and how we can best equip advisors to serve end investors. And um, it oftentimes, you know, takes a while to, to turn the ship to get people on board with these, um, with these newer approaches. But um, I think if you go back to the fundamentals, am I doing the right thing for the end client? Am I doing it with a high standard of care in their best interest? Those are the things that should really drive how we, how we serve people with financial services. I, I 100% on, on both of, both of your answers. And, and I guess the way I'm, I'm wired myself, I'd rather just look at the person across from the table and kind of just have these discussions and go from there. Because I don't know, uh, uh, maybe I'm skeptical, but I, I don't, almost don't care what a paper says. It, it's just, what, what am I, obviously there's legal recourse if there's something written down. But that being the case, I, I just like to, you know, have a conversation with somebody and make sure they are acting on on my best interest. Uh, the other thing I would say, it's funny, right? Because I, I think you're hinting at this and I'm, I'm beginning to use this phrase a lot, but I, I think annuities right now in this current day and age are paying for the sins of their fathers, if you will. And uh, and and, and I, I guess I can, I'm old enough now that I can say that I've been in this business for since 01, right? So 20 years. And you, things kind of move in cycles right? in, in terms of uh, the, the way it works, right? And when I got on board, it was annuities are bad. You're right. It's like kryptonite. That's it. Be done with it. And there was a movement towards this fee only. But I think what's happened unexpectedly now is that as much as they, you know, the phrase was annuities are, are sold, not bought. Hand over my heart. You can say with, without, without uh, hesitation, at least I can, that model portfolios based on an AUM fee model are sold, not bought. <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, and I think over time, this is what, and if you read the investment press nowadays, you know, they're always trying to find gotchas for for consumers, right? Hey, you don't want to do this. You don't want to pay for annuity. You don't want to pay for these fees that you have with mutual funds, which is very true, 100%, right? What you're seeing now in the investment press is, why are you paying 1% for a model portfolio? Yeah, that kind of thing. And, and what I'm getting at, it, it seems to me, the AUM driven advisors in the zeitgeist, if you will, are becoming, quote unquote, the bad guys 
in, in the sense of where there are liability that individual consumers can scratch off their balance sheet and save themselves money because it's an unneeded expense, even though th there's this way th there's this waving of a flag of fiduciary. And, and in that context, I think things are opening up more for what Wade said, for what you've been saying. Listen, if if, uh, there, if there's a place for contractual income within this person's you know retirement income plan, then it should be considered full stop. I I'll say that, Alex. Yeah, huh? And I would say I wouldn't, you know, I, I think you can't maybe use the same broad strokes to say that everyone that's selling um, or that's that's providing those those models are are doing so maybe in a in a negative way. But but to your point, I think there's there's opportunities for someone, whether you're commission based or whether you're fee based to act in a in a good way or a bad. Exactly. Way. Um, so yeah. And, that, that, that and to your point, listen, we have McLean Asset Management. That's that's largely. Uh, you know, that firm is largely a, an AUM driven wealth management firm. So I, I, I'm not, I, yeah, yeah. By no means am I like, uh, you know, big, you know, bathtub accounting kind of thing. It, it's just one of those things where, no, I, there, there, you, you can kind of shape the argument, you know, many times. And, and I think you need to just take a step back and, and recognize that, you know, there's, you know, the mirror has two faces, if you will. Uh, what kind of. So the, the, for FI360, and this is something that, that we use at, at McLean Asset Management, especially within the 401k space. What what advisors do you attract? Now I'm, I'm thinking of it from the standpoint, I'm an advisor. I have my advisor hat on and maybe they're listening about, they're listening to this and they're, you know, they say, hey, you know, John's a good guy. How can I find out more? Well, you know, am, am I kind of a good fit for FI360? You know, without, I don't mean it as a plug, but more like as a, what, who are, who are the advisors that are attracted to FI360? Like, what are they about? So, so they're really, they're those, um, the fee-based advisors and the hybrid advisors that Wade referenced. So we, we deal with both of them and we deal with individual advisors all the way up to uh, wirehouses. We've, we've got great relationships across the board. When you're working with a 401k plan in particular, you are under uh, ERISA's umbrella. You you have to act in a fiduciary capacity. So there are some advisors who maybe do some commission business, but they act in a fiduciary capacity with 401k plans. So we provide services for those folks to do investment research, monitoring reports, and other analysis on 401k plans. What I what I will say is that a lot of folks associate FI three hundred and sixty with retirement and 401k plans specifically. We, we are increasingly seeing interest from advisors on the wealth management side that are dealing with individual investors. We, we do a lot, I, I referenced it briefly um, earlier on with IRA rollovers, for example, and that's kind of, a, kind of a cross between retirement and wealth advising, where it's really wealth-centric advisors that are doing IRA rollovers. You're doing it out of a 401k plan and it's technically a retirement account, but if you deal with advisors in a fiduciary capacity, whether they are wealth accounts, whether they are 401k plans or foundations, endowments, we're a good firm for you to, um, to get to know, both with the tools and also with that, with that training, with that AIF, accredited investment fiduciary designation that we have. John, and because we're kind of, I'm trying to play a balance here, a little bit for advisors, a little bit for consumers. And I think it's very interesting uh, what, what you've said here. Incidentally, we use, again, we use FI360 also on the wealth management side. Uh, but you said rollovers. And I think this then segues nicely into the consortium. But uh, with regards to rollovers and your toolkit and what it does for advisors, I think it's important for consumers to recognize what goes on behind the scenes when there's a recommendation to transfer assets from a rollover to an advisor's account, you know, uh, towards a, 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 a towards you know a, a, an account that's being managed by an advisor outside of the four hundred one k plan. Why is that? Why is that dynamic something that you know opens up eyeballs? So there was a um, there was a rule that the Department of Labor and, and and for the consumers out there they might not be aware, but the Department of Labor actually plays a big role in overseeing financial advisors, specifically when those advisors are working with retirement accounts. And the Department of Labor came out with a new rule that went into effect in July of this year that basically makes any 
rollover activity. So when you're moving assets from a 401k plan into an IRA, that is now under a, a fiduciary purview for, for the most part. <clears throat> the reason that regulators really care about that is that the Department of Labor is looking out for end investors. They're looking for out for the everyday American worker, wanting to make sure they can retire with a, uh, with a good quality of life when they're done working. And one of the things that they have under their control is helping ensure that the advisors and uh, the other providers that work with folks in that retirement phase are doing so in a way that makes it really efficient from a cost perspective for folks. So if you're in a 401k plan with 10,000 of your coworkers, you get economies of scale. You pay less for a mutual fund than if someone you know, went and tried to buy that mutual fund with $1,000 on their own. So the, the big thing about those IRA rollover transactions is that they oftentimes result in the end investor paying more for their investments, for their advice than they do if they stayed in that 401k plan. So the advisors have an incentive to take someone out of a 401k plan, even if they're managing that plan, because they're going to make more money if they deal with them one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So the kind of a, a long-winded response but the regulators want to make sure that the pricing power that plan participants have doesn't get taken away by an advisor looking to, looking to make a quick buck off them. So they want to make sure that if you do take someone out of a 401k plan and put them into an IRA, that there's real good reasons for that happening. No, that, that's exactly what I want to get at. I mean, there, there's business model dedicated to just rollover IRAs. Roll, I mean, rollover 401ks. Wait, and, were you going to say getting something? into the the new consortium that you're developing so i guess a little more context around that with the 401k world there are annuities or different lifetime income options that now exist and the secure act that passed at the end of 2019 helped facilitate making that more common but that i think that's becoming a big issue with the consortium is are there lifetime income options inside of 401k plans? And if not, can that be a justification for a rollover or how to evaluate uh, a rollover based on wanting lifetime income rather than just necessarily looking at the investment options I might have in my IRA versus the, the 401k plan? That is, that is one of the criteria that you can use to justify rolling someone over, access to guaranteed income, lifetime income, that absolutely is one of the criteria that can be used to justify the rollovers. It's interesting, um, and I think probably not coincidental, that the Department of Labor has this rule about rollovers and making sure that they're really well justified. Um, they've also said one of their top goals for 2022 is increased access to guaranteed income within plan. So I think the Department of Labor realizes, to your point, Wade, that getting access to that guaranteed income is one of the justifications used for rolling people over tends to be a little bit more expensive if you're in an IRA versus in a 401k plan. So they're also trying to encourage the inclusion of those guaranteed income offerings within plan so that there's there's less need to roll over to um, to get access. So so think about that just as a as a as a concept. So the whole fiduciary annuities are bad, contractual income are bad, only fee only investment models are, are the way to go because that's the only way you can feasibly act in the best interest of somebody. ERISA, you know, the land of the fiduciary, if you will, are, are effectively kind of saying not so fast, you know, with regards to that, that statement, because there, there, there's a recognition that no, a contractual income does have a role in, in a retirement income plan. Is, is that a correct statement on my part? Well, I think so. I think if you if you look at the Secure Act, there is a, there's a safe harbor in there, essentially protections for planned fiduciaries if they select an annuity for inclusion with within the plan. So I think the Department of Labor is saying, yeah, you know, it's it's worth considering annuities, um, and we will give you some some protection um, if you do put an annuity in the plan. So I think there is a realization that that we need more guarantees for. Our, for our everyday workers. When, um, when I was growing up, my dad had a defined benefit plan. A lot of folks, parents had defined benefit plans. Um, and when you retired, that paid for your, for your retirement and it escalated over time. There's very few of those now. 
So I think there's a realization from the Department of Labor that with fewer defined benefit options out there, which is essentially a guaranteed um, payment, it's like an annuity payment is what a defined benefit plan is, and also people living longer, the combination of those things create a need for, for us to make more available. That's great. And with the consortium, who's part of it? Like who are some of the major companies, if you can name them? I, I should have maybe asked beforehand, just because this is a big deal. It's not just, oh, by the way, we have a minor consortium. It's It really is, you know, the who you want to be working with kind of thing if, if you're a plan sponsor. Yeah, I think it's really a who's who of um, asset managers and insurers in the defined contribution space, firms like um, BlackRock, Allianz, Nationwide, Prudential, Principal, Income America. Um, so it's really tremendous firms. And, and I would say I, I would pay the same compliment that you paid to me, Alex, at, at the beginning. They're, they're really the, the good guys and, and the good women in the industry, the folks that have aligned with this consortium. They're very much focused on doing the right thing for end investors um, and aligning that with their commercial um, interests, certainly. But um, they're, they're, they're really good, grounded folks. No, I, th I think this is a good point. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted you on as well, or Wade and I, is I, I, we get a sense from individual investors and consumers, there's just a skepticism, right? And there's, there's always this balance between cynicism and skepticism. Healthy skepticism is good. Cynicism kind of leads you into dead ends, if you will. And when it comes to the financial services, you know, there's this concept of in any financial service company is bad. You know, they're, they're trying to squeeze the extra, any extra penny. And guess what? The extra penny comes from my account. And so there's this sort of antagonism. And being in this industry for the time that I've been in, and I think Wade will, 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 will subscribe to this as well. There are a lot of folks that are actually watching out for the consumer's best interest. And, and you, you know, I, I would say, hand over my heart, you're leading that charge. But I, I don't think there's this realization about the number of folks behind the scenes that are really, they're not looking at it from the standpoint of just dollars and cents, dollars and cents. Yes, this is, it's a commercial entity. It's, it's not a charity. But by that token, the consumer's best interest comes first, second, and third, you know, in, in many of these decisions. Would you, uh, what, what would be your reaction to that statement? I completely agree with that. I, I'm really heartened when, when I go to a conference and I talk to advisors and when I talk to the people that are leading a lot of these financial services firms, that they really do want to make a change. It's a, it's a mission for a lot of these firms, just like it's a mission for us to do the right thing. And, and what I'll say is that one of the things that I'm really heartened with, with the, the folks that have joined the consortium specifically, is that our focus is on transparency. It's around creating a level playing field. And I think when you see some of the egregious negative things that create these reactions from people to not trust financial services in general, it's when, you know, firms or individuals are trying to pull the wool over your eyes. The individuals that have partnered with us on this consortium are doing the exact opposite, where they're trying to level the playing field, create transparency so that you can compare their offerings to others' offerings um, in, a, in a really easy to understand way. Okay, and John, we'll have on the show notes how consumers, because maybe there's folks that are plan sponsors that are wondering about this consortium and advisors just wanting to know. We'll make sure we have links out to to the consortium. So if people want to find out more, they, they can definitely do it. It's kind of one of these, it's an idea whose time has come. And and Wade, I think we're getting good because I think we can bring this full circle back to the RISA <laughs> <laughs> and, and John's involvement. And, you know, one of the reasons like John is in this is, is really to help us promote this RISA framework within this construct of contractual income with, you know, in, inside of the defined contribution space. Would, uh, John, reactions to that statement? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited. You, the RISA framework is the only academically validated categorization um, system that I've seen for retirement income out there, full stop. Um, and that is something that, that, we, that we really need. It really gets to leveling the playing field, making sure that you're looking at apples to apples comparisons, that you're not comparing a managed payout to a pure annuity offering. And that's where I think you can have people that have bad motives do bad things is when they're making these apples to oranges comparisons. So um, uh, frameworks like RISA uh, really align with the core of what we're trying to do 
which is to help make really informed, um, simplified decisions for end investors and, and for advisors and plan sponsors alike. No, thank thank you for that. And, and again, I, I think that's 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 good. We we, we tend to we, we always think this is a twenty minute podcast, and it ends <laughs> up uh, pushing the boundaries. And I know we we have you know we, we had you on until two o'clock, which is hitting it. So I don't want to extend that in, in respect for your time, but. Really, truly, thank you again for everything. I suspect you'll be on again, <laughs> to be honest, John. Uh, assume the sale, right, Wade? Uh, but uh, I mean, what can I say? But but thank you, and we hope our listeners got something out of this. Obviously, advisors, if you're unfamiliar with FI360, you you are now. You are familiar with it now, so you know what to do next. For consumers, I I just kind of want to let them know that under the water, there's a lot of folks rooting for the best interest of, of them, of their sort of retirement outcome. And John and, and his group is certainly uh, one, one of the protagonists in that initiative. And we're, again, I said it earlier, but we're tickled pink to, to have the RISA kind of uh, run in that lane a little bit. So I'll, I'll leave you guys with that. Uh, Wade? Yeah, I think you said that well. So thank you so much for joining us, John, today. And uh, we'll, we'll catch everyone next time on Retire With Style. Thank you. Thank you for including me. And, and thank you for being two of the big protagonists looking to do the right thing for end investors as well, too. It's really a pleasure for me to speak with you today and to be associated with you uh, at all. Oh, no, uh, pleasure. Thank but thanks. Thanks for the comments, man. <laughs>